from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, we have Marilyn Nelson. She was born in Cleveland and was raised on several military bases. Her books include The Fields of Praise, New and Selected Poems, which was a finalist for the 1998 Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize the 1997 National Book Award, and the Penn Winship Award, Magnificat in the Home Place, which won the 1992 Annisfield Wolf Award and was a finalist for the 1991 National Book Award, Mama's Promises, and For the Body. She has also published two collections of verse for children, including The Cat Walked Through the Casserole and Other Poems for Children, with Pamela Espeland. Her honors include two Pushcart Prizes, two Creative Writing Fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, a Fulbright Teaching Fellowship, and the 1990 Connecticut Arts Award. Since 1978, she has taught at the University of Connecticut Stores, where she is a professor of English. Her latest book is Snook Alone, which is illustrated by Timothy Basil Earing. Am I saying that right? Earring, okay. And guess who we have here? Timothy Basil Earring. He's illustrated numerous book for ch books for children of all ages, and he's the illustrator and author of the popular picture books, Next Out for Adventure, and the story of Frog Belly Ratbone. What a great name, wow. Which has been adapted for the stage. Earring is also the illustrator of the Newbery Award-winning The Tale of Despero. Ooh. By, <laughs> by Kate Di Camillo. It's been published in many languages and was made into a motion picture. I remember that. He also recently illustrated Finn Throws a Fit by David Elliott, and he's the illustrator of Marilyn Nelson's Snook Alone. He's a contributing illustrator of the serialized story called The Exquisite Corpse Adventure, available exclusively on the Library of Congress website. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Now we are, okay, we're on now. Thank you very much. Well, that was, a, Marilyn and I had talked about giving a slight introduction, you know, about ourselves and who we are, but that was fantastic. So I think we're gonna move right into, um, to uh, talking about Snook Alone, this, this new book. And uh, we just did a book signing just about a half hour ago and had a lot of people in line with this, with this book, so it's really exciting to see this new, new book out and in the public. Um, so we're just gonna kind of share back and forth and talk about inspirations. And I'm wondering if maybe, would you like to speak, because you know, the writing came first, and I know you have some friends and, and you know, your travel and, islands and, and, and emotions that all went into this book and maybe people would like to hear about your inspiration. Okay, um, this, this book uh, began for me, uh, it grew out of uh, my friendship with a man who is a former Benedictine monk and is now a Roman Catholic priest on an island in the Indian Ocean. Um, we were friends from college 45 years ago. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I was visiting once several years ago and he had three little dogs, uh, little, I think they were Jack Russell Terriers, although I made Snook a rat terrier because I wasn't sure. Um, he had these three little dogs who were adorable. One of them was named Snook. It was both of our favorite and while I was there, I happened to read a magazine article about someone who had abandoned a dog on an uninhabited island. And he and I talked about what an awful thing this was to do. And, uh, and I said, you know, I think the adventures of a dog on an island, though, could be a nice story for Amazing. children. So we okay, well, yes, go we're ahead. gonna go back and forth. I, by the way, didn't know the whole time illustrating this until the, towards the end that there really was this character, Abba Jacob, she calls Abba Jacob, uh, and a real dog, Snook. So later on when I met with Marilyn, Marilyn to talk about this stuff, I was like excited to see an actual photograph of Abba 
Jacob. It's probably best that I didn't see that at the beginning either, because then I would have tried to make it look like him maybe or something. But keep going. That was. So um, uh, we we spent some time talking about what could possibly make the, the we figured it would be him in the story and his dog, and what would possibly make him leave his dog behind on an uninhabited island. Well, just by chance, one of the things my friend is dedicated to is the preservation of an atoll in the Indian Ocean, St. Brandon's Atoll. And he had, the previous year, made an excursion with some other people to do a survey of the, the animals and birds living on these tiny little islands in this atoll. So we put that into, into the book. Uh, and um, the, 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 the book, well, no, no, maybe you should talk a little bit about, because it's a sea book. It's a book about islands. And I, I will say one last thing before handing it off to Tim again. Uh, my friend who, he had, um, had gone on several silent, solitary retreats on these islands in this atoll. And um, so he said, well, this is a, m he gave me a map of the atoll so that I could see all of the islands in the atoll. And then he said, well, it probably would be best to put Snook on this one particular island. And then he drew a map for me of this island. This is where he would probably be able to find fresh water. This is where the seabirds are nesting. Wow. This is the vegetation in this part of the island. So I. I left my visit with him with a map of the atoll and a hand-drawn map of Avocare Island and the image of Snook himself, who was a very, very sweet dog. He was the one of the three dogs. Snook was the one who would sneak into, into my room in the guest house <laughs> at night and sleep at the foot of my bed, even though he wasn't supposed to. Um, On a green mat? <laughs> yeah, well, actually in a chair, which he really <laughs> wasn't supposed to, yes. Um, so so uh, although I myself have not been to this island, I, I was equipped with a, a strong sense of the island from my friend and um, with a sense of uh, the adventures that, a, that a, a dog would have on an uninhabited island in the Indian Ocean. All right. So as an illustrator... Um, a lot of times you don't meet the author um, right off the bat. Um, I guess as, as I get farther into my career, maybe I've, I'll work with an author a second time or something. We'll have already met that author. But a lot of times you get this manuscript. It's just a typed out Xerox, black and white, you know, just like you get in school, these little, these little assignment. And um, uh, I read that. You know, Snook Alone is this, this w beautifully written. I don't know if anybody's read it yet, but here's this is it, and it is beautifully written. It so descriptive. It just came out last, last uh, week. The 14th, I think, yeah, was so the release date. Yeah. Um, so I was excited immediately because, uh, and I'm going to tell you about how I was inspired to illustrate this. Um, I had, I just brought a couple little snapshots. I just printed out these little, just some old pictures I scanned in. So first of all, I, I grew up with having dogs. And this, you probably can't see it that well, but this little dog right here, his name is Caesar. And he was an awesome, awesome dog. I mean, everybody could say that about their own dog, but he just had such a personality. And he used to go out in the boat with us all the time fishing. And if we had too many people in the boat, he had to stay on shore. We could watch him barking and running up and down that shore as we got farther and farther away. And we would literally go back. It's like, okay, get in. And here, and he came. So, so his personality of just hanging out with them, whatever you know, if we were just taking walks in the woods or down the beach, I had all those memories of you know the dog personality stuff to kind of plug into this snook who I've never met that I felt like I knew already just by reading about him. And uh, so there was like the kind of the dog inspiration. Then um, I had. Uh, a lot of excitement in my body and mind about where this was taking place and um, 
this whole island thing, and there's a couple reasons. Um, I love fish. I'm a beach bum. I grew up on Cape Cod, and I'm, I just spend a lot of time on the beach. I still do. I love surfing, fishing, boating, all that kind of stuff, adventure. And um, so this whole island thing was like, oh, this is great. I get to draw this cool stuff, this island stuff. And another, I'm holding up a picture of, a, of the United States ship Kitty Hawk. And I was stationed on this ship. I was in the Navy before I started art school. I went to the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Um, but I, quite, I wasn't quite ready for school yet. Uh, even though I loved drawing and everything, I was just like, I wanted to run my friskies off or whatever it was. So I moved from Cape Cod, went all the way to California. I'm on the ship and we sailed all over the place. I went to Hawaii and Africa and Japan, the Philippines and Australia and Diego Garcia. And, and uh, it was an uh, unbelievable adventure. And um, like here's a, an old picture of me, uh, just a silhouette of, I was on Diego Garcia and walking around the tidal pools just like this is all relating to the book stuff, catching stuff like little octopus and, and, and spiny lobsters and all kinds of cool stuff. So after college, I, um, this all relates to actually illustrating the book. My dad had been trying to learn how to sail for years growing up on the Cape, breaking his knuckles and knees and uh, just trying to learn how wind goes through sails. And eventually when I was kids, there was five of us that got out of school, he saved up his pennies and bought a a boat that was worthy of sailing farther than just Cape Cod Bay. He says, would you like to go on a trip? And I said, are you kidding me? I would love to. And he wanted to sail from Florida to Guatemala. And for five months, I was on a boat with my dad, and we sailed on a little 30-foot boat from Florida to Guatemala. And it was a trip of a lifetime. And on that trip, we just had so many adventures, I can't even tell you. I mean, we saw you know, beautiful scenes like going through, we went around the Bahamas, all over the place, little lighthouses, and, and that, that lighthouse, for the first little example of how illustration, uh, you're inspired by like memories as, as an illustrator, there's just a little tiny drawing here in the beginning of the book, and it doesn't necessarily have to look exactly like what I saw as a lighthouse, but I just picture that little red and white striped lighthouse, and I plugged it in right there, and you just start putting in your own memories as well as these images that you're developing from reading text. So there was stuff like that. And then there's stuff like this. These, she talks about living in a little hermitage. Uh, I saw, I actually, for eight bucks a night, folks, Belize, <laughs> these little grass huts. And I actually did one of my first books, my, uh, The Diary of Victor Frankenstein. It was back in 1997. I was drawing it while I was sailing on this trip. And uh, when it was too rough out there, the seas were too big, we'd pull in these little places and for eight dollars, get one of these little huts, and I would sit in there and draw for a day or two till the storm kind of settled down. And that leads into storms. I saw all kinds of storms, again, relating to, that's how Snook is separated from Abba Jacob by a huge storm. And Abba Jacob has to take the boat and go to the leeward side of an island. So I was thinking about all my travels during this and these little anchorages. That's our boat right there in the middle of an uninhabited island in the middle of the ocean, you know, just, it's, it was so awesome. Um, so all this is relating to the story, and I was thinking about, you know, trudging around the mangroves, we were snorkeling, and in fact, one time, you were just talking about little adventures, I know there's a car that's going to say, 10 minutes left, and a hook's going to come outside, <laughs> and I know it's going to sidetrack, but we were snorkeling in this lagoon, and it's a great idea when you, when you anchor to hop out of the boat and dive down and check on your anchors visually with your mast to make sure they're set, because these squalls and these storms come through all the time. So we get down there and make sure that Dansforth anchor is just wedged right in that sand, and then we say, okay, let's just check out the area, see if there's any good lobstering around here. My dad and I were, were swimming around this, I mean, there's no one around. And uh, we were in there for about 30, 45 minutes, and we were coming up to this other shore, this little coral reef, and like when you're walking down the street sometimes, you just feel like, you get this weird sense where you just kind of want to turn around and feel like there's somebody there, you just, you know, just human nature, some instincts, and I had that, I turned around, and there was this huge bull shark right there, he just like, his, his, from his throat to the top of his head was like that deep, the pectoral fin, just like you see on Discovery Channel, and we weren't snorkeling, we were just, I mean, we weren't scuba diving, we were snorkeling, so we had to keep coming to the surface, and he's right there, and my dad, had, he kept tugging on my fins here and there, like always joking about the shark thing, 
I poked him in the ribs, told him to go up, looked at him one time, took my snorkel, I said, big shark. We put our heads down, there it was, going broadside right in front of us. I had caught a barracuda, and, and to keep it fresh, I hung it over the side of the sailboat. I forgot all about it. It was dumb. It was a bad move. We were so excited to get in the water, so we started swimming back to the boat because we said, if we stay on shore, we're going to be there for weeks trying to make a raft out of coconuts. You know, there's like no, there's, there's no help here. We better, like, get this done now. So we swam very calmly back to the boat in the middle, and I could see that crystal clear water. I could see the barracuda hanging down and another shark under the boat. We get up onto the boat. I, I slopped up onto the, to the dinghy, the little Zodiac we had. My dad tried to climb up the little ladder on the back of the transom with his, I joke all the time, he's got his flippers on. They're that long. The ladder's got about that much room between the ladder and the transom. He crawled up on his knees with his, with his flippers peeled back like little onions. And we, we looked in the water, ripped our mask off. There were three bull sharks that circled our boat for like 45 minutes. And I'm recalling all this because Snook was looking for uh, little fish and stuff in these little um, tidal pools on this island. And Marilyn describes about like being aware of these little baby sharks that are prowling around, these little predators and stuff. And so I literally had like deep thoughts for like, you know, to be inside Snook's mind as well as like having my dog memories and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, here's like a little spiny lobster we caught. So she describes all these creatures and stuff in there. So these all related, and I was so excited. So, uh, you know, as an illustrator, I, my, the way I like to work is from memory. I, I, all day long, I look at stuff. I, I stare at things. I'm definitely one of those guys that, that gets, you know, stops to smell the roses. I, I stop and smell the roses. I start to look under the rose bush. I'm, everybody's already there you know, 10 minutes ahead. I'm, 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 there's a turtle, uh, and I'm at the rose bush for like a half hour and late again. So I like to take those memories and try to draw without looking at scrap. Of course, I had to look up, you know, just like, so what does a rat terrier look like? And I love that he had floppy ears. I love floppy ears rather than the pointy ears. And um, so I started drawing, and I was on this, this trip. I was in Kansas, and the first drawing that came out of Abba Jacob, I don't think I've shown you this yet, it was on a napkin. And um, I'm going to have big slides. when I, I, I do school presentations, and I'm, I'll have this on PowerPoint. These will be big and colorful, but for now, I just, uh, because of the tent, we didn't have PowerPoint. But right on a napkin, and then I, had a, I, was, I bought a bagel. I was in an airport, and I opened up the bagel bag and laid it out and just started doing my first sketches on the back of the bagel bag uh, of Abba Jacob. And I love this little kind of round shape, this little round head and the, the monk kind of shape. And um, so I brought those back to the studio and got started on the sketches. And that's the whole way it all started happening for me. And I recalled this, this trip, the, 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 you know, the adventures that I've been on while illustrating this thing. And, and uh, there's... There's an image of, you know, the storm. I don't know if I can find everything here right away, but here, here's when they go on the adventure, and they get this assignment to catalog the plant and animal life on these surrounding atoll islands. And, and that's just what my dog used to do. You know, just go right up to the bow, and he, his, wind, his airs would be flapping in the wind, you know, just like you said. And I could just, it was like, illustrating is hard. I mean, when you have a blank white piece of paper, it's hard sometimes. You're, you know, an hour or two goes by and nothing good happens. You know, you get, it takes a long time to finally start making. So I like to start scribbling. And, but with, with Marilyn's writing, you know, things, I had that image in my head. And I know about the storms and, and holding a boat um, into the waves. You know, if you have the transom of that boat with the waves coming in like this, the waves smash against that flat part of the transom and water gushes up into the boat and you can swamp and sink your boat. So just like, I was, I was enjoying that I could draw these little, you know, here's a couple of guys that, that were helping out and they're holding this boat with the bow in the, into the wind. And, and uh, you know, I love all this stuff. And there's, you know, Snook was busy snorting around for rats. And so, you know, and there he is just howling into the wind and it's just helpless. He's, he is officially separated from his buddy. So, um, and then mornings, I, I love like going surfing early in the morning First light, fishing, going, walking down a big open beach. I don't know if you've ever been to Cape Cod. Miles and miles of beautiful beach um, that are just untouched. You know, there's no cottages or anything, just beautiful dunes. And all those memories, you know, come through when I'm, when I'm doing that. And just all, all, almost everything in there is, is from things I've experienced. And, 
even uh, being on Diego Garcia and seeing these like coconut crabs, these giant crabs and stuff. So for you guys that are looking for a little adventure and a lot of emotion, this story is really cool. And Snook, when he's alone, he really does have all these cool things happen. And there's one, uh, like there's the shark one, where he's like looking around these little tidal pools and stuff like that. Um, I don't know how much, how much where, where are we at for time right now? Where's, where's our timer? It's uh, uh, one, one. We have 15 minutes left? Okay, so we, we were going to save some time for a question and answer. Do, would you guys like to uh, ask I'm some questions? I'm going to say so oh, just one, one thing first. Um, uh, I just want to say that although in every book has several levels of meaning, and although this book is an adventure story about a dog that's left on an island, it's kind of a dog version of Robinson Crusoe. Um, on one level, that's all it is, is an adventure story. But as I said, it began for me uh, with a friendship with a former monk who has himself sailed. He sailed once from Southern Africa to Brazil on a sailboat with four other people. And he's had them, he's, he's a, a, a man who has adventures. Um, but the, for me, the, the book began with the idea that it could teach young people something about what it means to pray. That the, oh. the snook belongs to a monk, and so he has spent his whole life you following the rhythms of a monk's life, which is a rhythm of work and prayer. So that when snook is left alone on the island, he conducts his work as usual. His work is to catch rats. That's what he does, he's a rat terrier. But, his, but the work is punctuated by periods when he sits on the beach and listens to the waves, when the waves become like the sound of his breath. And he sits there longing for his friend, his Abba. And I'm, I had hoped that this would be a book which would enable grown-ups reading it to children to talk a little bit about what it means to long for someone who loves you and who you know is out there, but you can't see him. And um, so this is the good I'm, stuff, I'm, I'm folks. hoping that there are... This, are is, where, this is the good stuff. <laughs> that, that, um, that it's a story with a couple of layers. It's not necessary to read that second layer into the story because it's a terrific adventure. Um, but it's possible to use this story as a way of thinking about something else in our universal human experience. So I, I don't know whether I have a minute to read a little. Oh, yeah. A little tiny yes, bit. Yes, yes, yes. New little. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, this is the beginning of the time. The, the book begins by describing the life of Snook with his Abba, what they do every day. And uh, then it describes how they get separated. And this is the beginning of, of uh, Snook's, Snook's um, aloneness. In the morning, there were only faint sips of his friend's scent left for Snook to drink in here and there. He sat on the beach watching a band of clear sky fill with streaming light. Snook was thirsty. He sniffed past the squealing rats and mice and the nesting birds, quack, quack, as they rose in alarm and formed a black spiral overhead. He followed his nose to a sandy hollow in a circle of velvet-leafed arguisia bushes. There he dug, tentatively at first. Then, as the scent of fresh water grew stronger, he dug furiously, making the sand fly. At last, he lapped sweet water. Then he made his well larger and drank and drank. On his way back down to the beach, he marked many trees. 
<laughs> okay, that's enough. Uh, now we can have question and answer. Well, wait, can, can I ask, can I have, ask for a yes. quest? Yes. You gotta just read one more. So, okay. So, with, we can't give it the, the ending in the way. The ending is just like fabulous. I read it from is. the book on the, on the day it was, it was published. I read the first part of it and I thought, well, that's enough. I'd read about five pages. And one man said, no, how does it end? How does it yeah, end? Yeah. So, this is a good one. Yeah, okay. I read one more page then. This is Ooh. a description of um, the sea turtles come ashore to lay their eggs. There's sharks too. Maybe should I read the, nah. No, no, no. By afternoon, yeah. the northwest beach had been scored by dozens of carapaces. The high, dry sand dug up and covered by many graceless flippers. But one last turtle was still digging. Snook lay in the scant shade of a Suriana and watched her labor. Her beak open as if to pant, she dug with one rear flipper and one heeled stump. Her eyes, half closed, streamed tears. She seemed as old as the world. She laid dozens of eggs, covered them with sand, and as dark fell, dragged her weight back to the deep. Is that like good or what? That is <laughs> such good writing. And then Snook's alone again, like even his little sea turtle friend that he had for a couple of minutes. And something I read about sea turtles is that when they come ashore, nobody can explain why they weep. They, they weep tears. And so um, in the, the weeping eyes of a sea turtle become uh, something inside of Snook in his heart. It, it uh, fills him with compassion. With, again, this is the second layer of meaning. On the one layer, it's just a sea turtle weeping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But those, those words make illustrating so fun when you get to have an assignment like that to work with words like that. Thank you, Marilyn, for, for that. That's Thank you. awesome. Thank you. Awesome. John? Question and answer, yeah. It, it's definitely, unless you have something else you definitely want to add no, in. No, I don't. I hope we've left at least a couple of minutes for a couple of questions, if there are questions. Not a, oh, wait, we have, we have a. So much. Um, and I was wondering, don't you have a book about George Washington Carver? Is that I do, you? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. that is one of my absolutely favorite books. So it's not a question, but I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate that book, and I use it with my students who are going to be teachers all the time, and Great. we all Great. love it. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I think about Carver a lot lately because among his inventions were gasoline made out of peanuts, motor oil made out of peanuts, and uh, there was something just recently that was, uh, oh, uh, uh, someone is starting to make some kind of a peanut-based food for uh, a famine. There's some people, something about North, someplace in like Kenya where people, there's a famine and somebody's made this peanut-based. Carver did that 60 years ago. Exactly the same thing, but he never, he's not connected to his discoveries because he didn't sell the formulas. He gave them away free. Um, so I, I read all the time about things that new people are making money on, but they really are Carver inventions that were, that, that were made in the 40s. So thanks for mentioning that book. Yes. Um, I wondered if you had any pets. I or I, I grew up with dogs. I've had lots of dogs in my lifetime. My, I'm not sure I had two who were wonderful. One was an Irish setter and one was a miniature pincher, miniature Dober, Doberman. But my Irish setter was a genius dog. I, she was <laughs> scary, scarily intelligent, really. So yeah, you? We have two kitties and they're pretty smart too. They learned how to open up their food box. They learn how to, 
Yeah, you don't want a pet that's quite that smart, right? Yeah. Yeah, I had a friend who had a dog and learned how to open the refrigerator. <laughs> you get beer? <laughs> I had a goat and a rat. A pet goat, yeah. We used to go clamming with it. Everybody's like, that's not a dog they're with, that's a goat out in the sand flats, clamming. Well, I guess you had to put a lock on the refrigerator. I'm curious, you mentioned that you start out with drawing, but then later on when you go to the fi finished illustrations, what medium do you use? I use acrylic a lot because I do like to, I use actually all, all kinds of mediums, oils and acrylics and charcoals and inks and everything. But um, I do use acrylics a lot. And one reason I like them is you can uh, create layers uh, quicker with the acrylics. Because I use, I use uh, heat guns and uh, water bottles to spray and like kind of erode paint and then arrest the erosion with, with uh, heat. It's kind of like a hair dryer. Mm -hmm. And then you can quickly add layers onto that and you know, it's still in that same session, not waiting for oil layers to dry and stuff. So okay. acrylics you. mostly, I'd say. Hi. Uh, the text comes oh. first, right? And the pictures come afterwards. Um, so you don't change the text, I assume. It stays what it is. But did you guys ever argue about the pictures? Wow. Well, was, I don't think we've ever really argued argue ever. About <laughs> Wait a <laughs> minute, that was that time. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> there, was, there was one, oh, I'm talking to this. There was one uh, very small thing because I, as I, we both said, Abba, the Abba is a real person. And so when the first sketches uh, came to me, I sent them to my friend. And my friend is, uh, and he's a monk, but he's vain. And <laughs> he, he said, well, you know, the art is a little bit rotund, don't you think? <laughs> Pixar says story is king, and that's totally true. However, my little, it's not even a question, statement is the pictures that you created drew me to this book before I even knew who was going to be speaking. I didn't know you were the artist for Tale of Despero. Despero wouldn't be Despero without your art. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. Woo. That's wow. I thank you so much. I, I have to say, when you're making art, when you're writing, just making art in probably all the forms, you're you're almost you're an introvert. I maybe I should speak for myself, but like I, I do hear similar things. You're in the studio by yourself and you're trying to create and you have this blank white page or paper or computer screen or something. And um, you're there for a lot of hours alone trying to figure this stuff out. And you know, my eyes get glassy when I hear stuff like that because you have this like huge extrovert life. That, you know, when this book comes out, you do stuff like this, like the National Book Festival. Like this is so awesome. And to hear comments like that, I'm, I will definitely be in a taxi like headed to the airport, just like, <laughs> wow. Like, and I'll call my mom again. Like, <laughs> it's like this. It's just awesome. Thank you for saying that. That's, Thanks. Big payoff. Hi, two quick questions. One is, um, Timothy, in the picture of the lighthouse, is that Hope Town in Abaco in the Bahamas? No, that, uh, um, that was, uh, I think that was Nassau Light. Because we checked in there because of a big storm. We were, like, we were heading to like the Berry Islands I think, at that time. And I think, have you been to Nassau? Is th yeah, <laughs> there's two. Yeah, that's there's there, right? one's in Hope Town. Well, one's in Hope Town, Elbow Key in the Bahamas, and that the, okay. the Curly Key. There's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second question is, uh, how did you originally come to your co collaboration? How did how did you two get together? Did you know your work? Was it your publishers, agents? How did it happen? Well, you know, from what I'm finding, that the publisher puts authors and illustrators together, and um, because we hadn't met before the book. And Marilyn sends the manuscript in, and, and uh, Candlewick Press is who we work with. And uh, <coughs> they just have you know, an arsenal of illustrators and writers, and, and they kind of know everybody's style. And they, they approached me. They read it first and said, hey, t you know, Tim might have 
because I, you know, I, I, I developed a friendship with my editor, Karen Lotz, who's the president over at Candlewick, and she'll say, the more you know about each other, kind of the better it is, because she knows what I love of adventure and sailing and water and all kinds of stuff, so that's how you, you're placed a lot of times, just without even meeting sometimes till the end. That's interesting. Thank you both very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for Over time. for us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.